Hello YouTube, welcome back to my channel. My name is McPato and this is McPato PC. And today we'll be taking a look at AMD Vega and how to find its sweet spot. So if you whether you have uh, Vega 56 or Vega 64 or Frontier Vega, <coughs> there's a lot of untapped potential in your Vega card if you're just using the default settings that come with Wattman. And I will say I'm sorry if you guys are hearing Dr. Phil in the background. Uh, someone is listening to Dr. Phil, and uh, hopefully it's not picking up on the mic, but if it is, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe you'll get some free counseling while you're watching my video. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I've had Vega now for about a month. I've done a lot of testing, guys. Hours and hours and hours of testing. And uh, I have to say I'm really impressed so far with the results. Um, I think a lot of the initial uh, benchmarks that had come out when Vega first was released last year, around August, uh, I think a lot of people were not aware of the potential of Vega when you underclock or sorry undervolt Vega, uh, as well the importance of these HBM memory speeds in obtaining the performance. And uh, anyway, we're going to cover all that stuff. But what I've done in this video is I've created four profiles that I'll refer to throughout the video. The first is a stock profile, and what that is is using AMD Wattman, just the default balanced profile on my AMD Sapphire Reference Vega 64. So uh, that's the first profile. The second one, what I did is I increased the speed of my HBM2 from the 945 stock megahertz to 1100. Uh, it is worth noting that my particular card does go higher. I'm not sure how high. I kind of went with a number that I was reading in uh, Reddit and other forums that people were able to obtain using the reference Vega cards. So 1100 seems to be pretty obtainable for a lot of people. Uh, it is worth noting that if you have a newer card or an aftermarket card, an AIB card, you likely have HK Hynix memory, not Samsung HBM2, which means you're probably not going to be able to hit that 1100. Uh, the Vega 56 cards, I think, uh, 1050 megahertz. Uh, sorry, no, about about a thousand, 990 ish, I think, is about the top end for a lot of people, and I'm not sure on the Vega 64s, but in either case. Increasing your HBM2 does give you a pretty generous performance increase. You'll see that in the video. So whether you're able to get the 1000 MHz or 1100 or 1150 or whatever it is, if you can do that and do that stable, uh, that's probably your first your first tip. But again, you'll see that later on. So what I did there again in that HBM overclock profile, I went to 1100. I undervolted a little bit and uh, I think about 10 millivolts. I think millivolts is the term, but I'll show you guys my profile here in a minute. The third option I did using MSI Afterburner because it lets you select a specific um, clock speed on your GPU and a specific uh, fan number. So I went with 90% fan on that one. Um, so what I did there is I went 1730 megahertz on the GPU and I slid the the power to all the way to the right so 50% power um, increase and the memory is at 1100 there also so that's kind of what I was figuring would be the sort of high-end maximum manual overclock uh, so that's my, I call it my brute overclock profile. And finally, my fourth profile is an undervolted profile where I reduced the millivolts on the P6 and P7 from 1200, I think it is, P7 down to 1115 or so. Again, I'll show you guys the profile here in a minute. Um, or rather than show you, I'll put in the description of the video the specifics for each profile okay so if you want to have a look what is my memory overclock profile what is my brute overclock or what is my undervolted overclock 
they're all going to be in the description below just make it a little bit easier a little bit quicker um, so I then tested everything using these settings uh, I did three runs of each test to get an average uh, and that's pretty much what I did in three of my slides the last three you're gonna see also included the GTX 1080 and that is my GTX 1080 Strix that I had before uh, I actually sold it to buy this Vega card uh, so I did include the numbers for Fire Strike using that card uh, both in the stock or manufacturer overclock setting as well as my manual overclock so the fir the one that doesn't say OC behind the Strix is the stock Asus Strix settings okay again on the middle profile um, and then I also included Tomb Raider Rise of the Tomb Raider benchmarks that has the GTX 1080 benchmarks included as well and the division also from my GTX 1080 overclock video uh, that's where I got those numbers guys I don't have the uh, oh, here's Watson I don't have the 1080 anymore so I couldn't uh, test it but needless to say I took those old numbers and I used them in this the settings are the same for the games as well as Fire Strike so I think you guys are going to be pretty impressed with the numbers I sure was uh, for a card that's supposed to be slower or barely as fast as a GTX 1080 you guys are going to be really surprised I think at what you're able to get with just a little bit of tuning on Vega 64 alright so before we dive into the slides I'm going to show you guys how to do these uh, different how to make these changes to your Vega card and then we're gonna get into the slides and then a brief conclusion so without further ado here's how you can set your overclock your undervolt and whatever else in AMD Wattman and then I'll just briefly go over MSI Afterburner Alright guys, so this is how you can start up the uh, AMD Wattman application. So you can click on your taskbar here, you'll see this little symbol, it says Radeon Settings. Right click on that and then select Open Radeon Settings. Or if you would rather, you can go down to your start bar, type in AMD Settings, and you can click on that. It'll bring up this screen that you see here and at the very top left click on gaming and then global settings global settings again here in the middle and that'll take you to this screen which is the AMD Wattman screen it's important to note that at the top there it says balanced you're going to want to slide that over to custom in order to make any alright guys so once you've got that slider moved all the way to the right for custom uh, down here you're going to find your voltage options so you can modify your voltage here the same is true for your HBM you just click the tab here it allows you to then go over and input any number you want in millivolts uh, here's where you would go to set your speed for your HBM2 as easy as moving the slider uh, left or right to the right for increasing the speed if you're overclocking anything definitely move this slider here for power all the way to the right it's very important and on the left here you got your fan profiles set the minimum to obviously the minimum and uh, target would be the sort of maximum it would go to make sure to hit apply to have any effect or have your settings take effect as well at the top here you can find your loading and saving of profiles Alright guys, in order to overclock through Wattman, you actually have to do that on this slider here. And moving the slider to the right, you will go up in half percentage increases. So if you wanted a 5% increase, you would move the slider to 5%. And that's over the base stock clock speeds. 
Now if you guys are overclocking using MSI Afterburner, it's a little bit uh, a little bit easier to use in my opinion. You just move the sliders to the right for whatever performance uh, increase you're looking for. Here's your power slider. You can also use your keyboard arrows to go up or down one percentage at a time or one value at a time. Uh, here's your core clock. You can pick a specific number for your GPU overclock. I like that feature here as well your memory uh, overclock. If you want to change your fan, click on the auto and then move the slider again. You can go in one one increments. Hit the check mark to have it take effect and you can then go to the left of that, click that button there and it resets everything back to stock settings. That's your brief overview of Afterburner. Alright guys, with that brief overview of how to use Wattman and MSI Afterburner, Let's get into some slides. YouTube, welcome back uh, to my face after those uh, slides. Hopefully you guys found that interesting. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you did, give me a like uh, down below there. If you really like it and you have an interest in Vega or my channel, uh, consider subscribing, guys. That helps me out a lot. It really is quite motivating and encouraging when I get subscriptions, uh, if rather new subscribers to the channel. It motivates me to make, uh, you know, the best videos I can make. It tells me that you guys are engaging in the content that I'm making and that you are relating to the subject matter that I choose to create. So if you guys do like the channel, please consider subscribing down below. Uh, your support is, of course, appreciated as always. Uh, so again, if you're interested in the different profiles that I used, Check the description below, you're going to find everything including fan profiles and uh, clock speeds, etc. Um, but as you can see from this video and future videos, hopefully, there's a lot of performance left on the table when it comes to AMD Vega. It's really too bad that they didn't tweak it a little bit better before releasing it because a slight undervolt, as you guys have seen, and that's not as low as I could go. Okay, I, I spent hours doing this, but I haven't really gone down to the nitty gritty. Uh, I would get the odd crash here and there, and I would just bump it up, you know, 15 to 25 millivolts until it became stable. So I'm pretty sure I could go down more. I would use less electricity, I would run cooler, and I would maybe even be able to squeeze a little bit higher percentage uh, overclock out of the the Vega card uh, that I have. So again, comes on a silicon lottery to a certain degree, and I do have a huge case, guys, the Thermaltake View 71 Tempered Glass Edition uh, with a ton of fans in there, so a lot of airflow. So my temperatures might be better than what you're going to get, but uh, if you buy an aftermarket card with a nice cooler on it, or if you liquid cool your GPU, uh, you can definitely probably get better than what I've shown you here uh, in terms of performance and not even not even be running at stock voltage which really tells you 
how much potential Vega has. If they start shrinking to seven nanometers, oh, here's Watson again. Uh, if they go down to that seven nanometer uh, process, I'm really quite encouraged with what they can do with Vega. And uh, just in closing here, I think it's important to note that Vega today versus Vega at release, they're not the same card. There's a ton of uh, performance potential from Vega via driver updates, via user settings, etc. So I would I would gladly take a Vega card or a 1080 if you're looking at that price point and if you're looking at that performance goal. Um, for 1440p guys, either one of those is going to be fantastic. Uh, I think Vega in the end, give it a year, year and a half, Vega and the 1080 won't even be on the same league, I think, in modern games that take advantage of Vega's uh, unique features. Look at Far Cry 5. I don't have it yet, but I'm going to get it. And uh, those benchmarks speak for themselves with the rapid pack math being utilized. Um, you know, you're going to see more and more of that in the future. Bethesda has a, an exclusive deal with uh, AMD to bring quality game experiences to AMD graphics card users and I think probably more studios are going to jump on board as well at least I hope they do um, Vega is a great card guys and once the prices settle down I think Vega is a great option for anyone looking for 1440 or not necessarily ultra settings 4k but again guys my name is McPato this is McPato PC and I'm saying goodbye for now I'll come back at you guys soon with another video. And uh, again, like, subscribe. Thanks for your support, guys. Have a great day. Bye-bye.